Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to take off my mask really quick while I'm up here. It's so good to see you here, and thank you for making it in the rain in September. How weird is that, right? Um, I'm Shauna Sherman, the manager of the African American Center here at the library. It's on the third floor, and I'm so glad to see you all here for our program today, Change Makers, honoring the um, African American heroes of San Francisco based on the murals at the Ella Hill Hutch Community Center. Before we get started, I'm going to just do a couple of announcements. First, we have a land acknowledgement. We are broadcasting from the area now known as San Francisco, which is on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramai Tushaloni peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the original peoples of this land, the Ramai Tush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. We recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community. We also have an ancestral acknowledgement that's adapted from the African American Reparations Advisory Committee. We honor the gifts, resilience, and sacrifices of our Black ancestors who toiled the land, built the institutions that established this nation's wealth and freedom, and survived anti-Black racism despite never being compensated nor fully realizing their own sovereignty. We acknowledge this exploitation of not only labor, but of our humanity, and through this process are working to repair some of the harms done by public and private actors. Because of their work, we are here and will invest in the descendants of their legacy. So again, thank you for being with us today to celebrate Change Makers books. So thankful for our partners, the Leo T. McCarthy Center and USF and Human Rights Commission. And it's so exciting to be able to tell new stories about the African American contributions in San Francisco. That's something that we're about at the African American Center at the main library, and we hope that more of this happens. So um, I won't be moderating our show today. It will be Steph Dr. Stephanie Sears. And before I invite her up to the podium, I'm going to give a brief introduction. Stephanie Sears is an associate professor of sociology at the University of San Francisco. Originally from Indiana, Dr. Sears received her PhD from Yale University's Joint Program in African American Studies and Sociology and her BA in Psychology from Stanford University. Stephanie is a passionate advocate for the Black community. As the director of the Peer Resource Center at Galileo High School in San Francisco, she worked with high school students to become agents of change in their own lives. Building on this experience, she worked with other women to create the Girls After School Academy, an after school program for African American girls living in San Francisco's public housing. She served as the fledgling organization's first board chair and later returned to work in the organization as the director of programs. Currently, she is an active participant of Engage SF, a transformative university community initiative that seeks to achieve community identified outcomes, supporting children, youth, and families in the Western edition. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie Sears up to the podium, and she will be telling us more about our program today. Thank you. Thanks, Shauna, for that very generous introduction. And welcome, everyone, to this amazing event. I'm so honored today to serve as the moderator for this Changemaker conversation. Um, now, before I introduce our esteemed panelists, I just want to provide a brief overview um, of the historical and political context to frame our conversation today. Um, and I also want to provide a high level overview of how this book actually came to be. So in order to understand the Fillmore and Changemakers, um, we have to understand the neighborhood of the Fillmore and how it came to be. Now, Black San Franciscans, ever since they've arrived, have constructed a legacy of resistance and change making that has not only shaped San Francisco, but has also had an important role in US politics and culture. 
African Americans arrived in what we think of as San Francisco in the early 1700s. And they were among some of the early California settlers and landowners that actually helped establish San Francisco. Moreover, with the gold rush, free and enslaved blacks arrived and began working in the gold mines. And eventually many of them settled near the waterfront and actually expanded their community up towards Telegraph Hill. Now this small but very mighty community faced a lot of challenges. There was illegal enslavement during this period and there was massive discrimination, yet they still owned real estate, they created schools, businesses, political organizations, newspapers and churches that anchored the community and amplified black voices. Now, while the number of Black folks stayed around 1500 until around World War I, and it increased to about 4,000 at the onset of World War II, it was really between 1940 and 1950 that San Francisco's Black population exploded. It went from around 4,800 to almost 50,000, right? And the vast majority of these folks lived in the Fillmore. Um, by the end of World War II, the Fillmore became known as the Harlem of the West. It was the center of black life, music, and entertainment. The district had 63 small businesses and more than two dozen active nightclubs and music joints, which hosted artists such as Billie Holiday, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, John Coulter. I'm just listing some of my favorites. So <laughs> there are many, many other, I'm just listing my favorites. Um, now, the development of the Fillmore was fueled by three major factors. First, many Black folks were leaving the South to escape Jim Crow segregation and the intensive racial hostilities and violence that were present during that moment. Two, many of these newcomers were recruited specifically to take jobs in the region's bustling waterfront and shipbuilding industries that were created by the wartime economy. And three, because of the forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans into internment camps and the discriminatory housing practices such as redlining and racial covenants that limited where black folks could not only buy but also rent, they moved into the available housing in the Western edition. The Fillmore became a city within a city. It was a community for us by us. Now, in the midst of this exponential growth and cultural development, these racist, racist housing policies continued and other forms of racial discrimination intensified. For example, San Francisco's housing discrimination was put into the national spotlight when in 1957, sports legend Willie Mays was unable to purchase a home in San Francisco's Tony St. Francis Wood neighborhood because the owner refused to sell to Negroes. Now, during the 1960s, Black activism in San Francisco exploded. Black and white allies organized by CORE, the NAACP, and the Ad Hoc Committee to End Discrimination used sit-ins, marches, pickets, and parades to demonstrate against discriminatory hiring practice in San Francisco's um, grocery stores, department stores, hotels, banks. And these struggles put San Francisco's Black community and the fight for civil rights into the national spotlight. In addition, the Black Panthers had an office in the Fillmore from which they offered their community programs. Yet, it was urban renewal and redevelopment that ultimately altered what we know now as the Fillmore. Using the rhetoric of blighted and slum clearance to morally justify destroying a thriving neighborhood, urban renewal, or what James Baldwin called Negro removal, shuttered over 800 businesses, demolished an estimated 2,500 Victorian homes, and displaced between, the numbers range between 10,000 and 30,000 people from the Fillmore. Now this devastation didn't happen without a fight. Community organizations were created to stop the devastation, and other community members even tried to work with redevelopment organization in an attempt to sort of alter the devastating course. Yet it's within this context that our panelists today, some of them grew up, some of them developed their vision of justice, and some of them practiced and honed their change-making practices. 
Now I'm sure they will have much more to say about the fight for the Fillmore and the fight for racial justice in, in San Francisco for Black Americans. I just want to say that when we think of San Francisco, we often think of it as a progressive city. And as my colleague Rachel Brahinsky always reminds me, San Francisco's progressiveness is a result of the hard won fought, the hard fought battles that African Americans and others have waged to make this city progressive. Moreover, these struggles continue, and it's African American change makers like those we'll hear from today that are often at the forefront of these struggles. So I'm switching now to the book, okay? But y'all had to know that, right? Because when they come up here, y'all gotta understand what they were up against, what the community was like. So it's this history and, this, and the importance of this history, not just to Black San Franciscans, but to San Francisco in general, that really motivated this book. This book celebrates Black excellence and honors the change-making legacies of the 96 people represented on the Inspiration Murals located on the walls of the Ella Hill Hutch Community Center. If you haven't been, go. It's on McAllister and Webster, and you can see them for yourselves. This book is, I don't know if there's a word bigger than collaborative, like that really talks about the number of like entities and people that had to go together to make this happen. But this book is a massively collaborative effort and represents the best of what can happen when many people come together to create something for the greater good. So here's how it all went down. In 2015, Brenda Harris approached Karen Cotterman from the Leo T. McCarthy Center. I was imagining doing this first like a sports announcer, but I'm not going to do that. But I was like, how do you kind of go through this and give it? Um, and about having USF students write the biographies of the change makers featured on the inspiration murals. In 2015, that same year, I was asked if I would be interested in having the students in the Esther Madrid's Diversity Scholars Living Learning Community collaborate with Miss Althea Carey, Miss Lynette White, and the late Eugene White. Affectionately, I called them the dream team. Um, I want to slow down here and just give a shout out to Miss Lynette, who's joining us on Zoom today. Without the guidance, direction, and passion of this dream team, this project would not have happened. Uh, they, generous, they generously gave their time and met with students. They came to campus for interviews so that my students could actually practice interviewing future change makers. Um, and they really kept pushing the project and holding the vision that this book was possible. So Miss Lynette, I know you're on Zoom, thank you. Um, Miss Althea Carey, thank you. And a big heavenly thanks to Mr. Eugene White for your conversations, your beautiful art, and especially the image of Ella Hill Hutch that graces the cover of this book, you are deeply missed. Now, at the end of the first year, the idea of this book that, that could hold all of these life stories was tossed about. Now, one of the important things as you get older, you begin to understand what you're good at and what you're not. And creating a book was outside of my skill set. But I happened to know someone who was really good at it. And that person's David Holler. So I reached out to David Holler, who was the faculty director of the Martin Burroughs Scholar LLC. And in 2016, the Martin Burroughs Scholars and David joined the team. Ultimately, a total of 87 USF students worked on this project and saw it to completion. In addition to completing the interviews, David and his students and research assistants researched, revised, fact-checked, and edited, thank you, David, the biographical information. They located the images, they secured the permissions, and they also designed the book. Now, while we're focusing on the change makers found on the inspiration murals today and those that spearheaded this project, we would be remiss if we didn't say a few words about the students. So I'm going to ask David just to say quickly a few words about the students. Stephanie, I can't, I can't thank you enough for that conversation we had in the hallway in 2015, <laughs> which led to this beautiful Beyond Collaborative effort. And it was just, um, 
I'm just enormously grateful. I want to say that first before I say anything. And my students are too. Here's what I have to say very briefly. Thank you so much for succinctly describing. I'm going to try to keep this to about a minute because I could just go on all day. This is my favorite thing that I've ever done in my life. I am enormously grateful to the university, to you, Stephanie, and to Leo T. McCarthy Center, to Miss Lynette White, to Mr. Eugene White, who helped, you know, this beautiful cover is right outside the hallways. We see students, Stephanie, our offices are really near. We see students studying right now in front of this beautiful portrait at USF. So, so yeah, it was beyond collaborative. And what I would say is I wish, um, wish I had some photos because you could see in the eyes of the students, their eyes glow when Miss Lynette came, when Miss Althea came, when Eugene came. And <clears throat> that was just the greatest reward of my professional life. This project means the world to me. We're not done with it, incidentally. We're on the fourth or fifth printing. There will be more. And I wish we had some students here, but hey, it's a Sunday. It's raining. Many of the students who worked on this would love to be here, but you know where they are? They're off in DC, they're in Sacramento, they're doing grad programs, they're doing beautiful work, but they all, without exception, say that this book was the best thing, the most important thing they did at USF. So thank you so much. Thanks, David. So in addition to the students, um, as you've heard, the book would not be possible without the support from the whole Leo T. McCarthy team, the team at SFPL, the, an, the um, archivist, I was gonna say the anarchist, the archivist, maybe they are anarchist archivist, and the African-American Historical Society, Wendy Nelder, Janine Yeomans, and the Walter and Elise Haas Foundation. So just again, lots of folks, lots of people came together. Now, the title of this book is Change Makers. So the question becomes then, what is a change maker? Now, drawing upon a definition put forth by the Ashoka Foundation, a change maker, and I want everyone, I love this definition. A change maker is a social innovator or a social disruptor that imagines a new reality, creates new possibilities, and takes creative action with others to solve a social problem for the greater good. They reinvent the rules. They do things differently. And they are prepared to travel against the current and go upstream. Changemakers move beyond intention and passion and translate thoughts into action. So without further ado, I just have a question. Are they, I know we have two change makers that are featured in this book in the audience. Are there any other folks in here that are in the book or have family members that are in the book? Okay. Um, do we have any folks on Zoom? Do we know? Okay, perfect. So today I'm going to now introduce our distinguished guests. Um, we are actually honored to have two change makers uh, speak with us about their experience and what it was like in the film world when they got here and what inspired them to be and do the work that they did. So the first person I would like to introduce is Dr. Shirley Thornton. Dr. Shirley A. Thornton is, a, is dedicated to the pursuit of equal education and opportunity. After dedicating her life to education as a teacher, counselor, and administrator, she then worked as the deputy superintendent of California schools. Dr. Thornton is a retired professor from the California State University Sacramento School of Education in the Educational Administration and Policy Studies Department. She has published a textbook, Transforming Schools, Finding Success for Students at Risk Through Systemic Change, and co-founded the Nonprofit Center for Excellence, where she continues to act as treasurer. From 1995 to 96, Thornton also served as director of San Francisco's public housing and is currently a field director at UC Berkeley's Principal Leadership Institute. So can we give a round of applause for Dr. Thornton? And then next up, we are very, very fortunate <laughs> to have Reverend Roland Gordon. And I just think this is a man who shows up at the right place at the right time. Um, okay, wait, hang on y'all, sorry. <laughs> this isn't as big as what I printed for myself. Um, 
Dr. Uh, Reverend Gordon was born in Greenwood, Mississippi and raised in my favorite state, Gary, Indiana, where he was a star player and captain of Gary Roosevelt High School's basketball team. In 1967, he went to Baldwin Wallace College where he obtained a bachelor's degree in education and a minor in business. He moved to LA in 72 and eventually, as he said to me early, the big man upstairs knocked on his door and he ended up going to the, where is it at? The San Francisco Theological Seminary. In 1978, he began his career pastoring at the Ingleside Presbyterian Church. Well, at the beginning, it only had four members, but now through Reverend Gordon's work and the rest of his congregation, it's a strong and thriving church. Now, one of the things that Reverend G is known for is the great cloud of witness, which is a mural that graces the walls of the Presbyterian Church. This collage of primarily newspaper and magazine clippings um, has and depicts prominent African American people in history. It's also been sort of, what is, it's part of the uh, historical landmark now, right? And so without further ado, we're going to also bring up Reverend Gordon and have him share with Dr. T their experiences. You can choose your seat. Yeah. Whichever one you'd like. We're good. Kind of sleepy. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Did I do? Did I do my professor thing too long? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I got in lecture mode. Um, so today we really just want to hear the stories of you all as change makers, how you got here, and how you became engaged and active in your community. But to get us started, we want to know. How did you get to San Francisco? What's your San Francisco story? I was born in New Orleans. Um, my family, uh, my brothers, I had three, six, seven, six, five, and six, four. Uh, we were taught to be outspoken, and that didn't work in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So my family realized we had to leave New Orleans if my brothers were going to survive. Mm -hmm. And when did your family arrive? In the 50s. In the 50s. OK, OK. Okay, um, I came to San Francisco in 1980, I'm sorry, 78, mm -hmm. uh, after uh, operating a little business in uh, Los Angeles, I um, did original greeting cards, posters, all handmade things by other artists in, uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles. And um, and then what some theologians call the hound of heaven started hounding me. <laughs> and, uh, um, and that's the bottom line. They were having problems in the field more with a lot of uh, the gang stuff going on. And uh, I like to think that my specialty was working with young, uh, especially African-American boys. Mm -hmm. And because of my athletic background, when they saw I could beat both of them playing basketball, <laughs> uh, they kind of took to me and uh, uh, we believe in education and uh, I was telling someone, I think I'm telling you that uh, Willie Brown says my legacy is the San, is the, uh, the Black History Collage that I have been working on for probably 40 years now. Uh, but I say it's the, the, the young African-American boys that many of them have gone on to do great things and have affected their lives. So they're, they're my legacy. Thank you. And Dr. T, where did your family, did you move into the Fillmore? Did you, um, how old were you when you got to the Fillmore? I was 13. Uh, we lived in Berkeley. Uh, we lived in Oakland, Berkeley, and then we moved to uh, California in Webster and okay. lived there for a couple of years. And then my family at the time, um, my mother wanted to buy a home out in uh, Ingleside. And every, every week the, the realtor would take us to Baby Hunters Point or someplace. My mother said, no, I'd like to have a home over in the Ocean View Merced area. Mm -hmm. And it took about 
two years or so before we were able to find someone who would sell to her. Mm -hmm. And so I lived on Grafton and then on Lee and uh, went to Galileo for a year and then went to graduated from Balboa, mm -hmm. where I later became principal. <laughs> So what was the Fillmore like when you all arrived? What was, what was it like? A lot of black people. Yeah, well, it's different now. <laughs> uh, yeah. What did that feel like? What, how was the vibe, the energy? And it was, the uh, California trolley would go, still went down California past our place, almost out to the beach. And then I guess they stopped it at Venice. But I mean, it was just a, a thriving community. It was just, you saw black folks, you, um, you know, you went to church, you did everything in that area, and it was normal mm -hmm. until it wasn't in the 60s when they did the redevelopment and gave people vouchers that had no meaning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Thornton is a hero in San Francisco far longer than I've been here. Again, I came in 1978 for seminary training at San Francisco Theological Seminary. And... Um, uh, but because, again, even Willie Brown, he, he boasts about my, my athletic, uh, I guess the word is prowess, <laughs> that people um, thought I was going to be an NBA ball player. And I always had the mentality, I think, I thought I was good enough. But again, the hound of heaven had a different uh, plan for me. But Lefty Gordon, who surely yeah, knows, yeah. another hero of this town, and Lefty is uh, in the book also. Uh, he, he uh, became like a big brother. He was born in, I think it's Vicksburg, Mississippi. I was born in Greenwood, Mississippi. But I was reared in Gary, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And, um, but bottom line, he was the real, he, when Lefty spoke, everybody came at the, the L.A. Hutch Community Center. Uh, my field was, um, again, I, uh, the church I served, when I came, I saw that it had an indoor basketball court. I, I remember my youth. We had to shovel snow off the ground to uh, play basketball in the winter times. And even as a kid, I said, there's no way I'm going to stay in Gary when I am able to move out. And uh, one of my great friends, uh, Alonzo Daniels, also an uh, outstanding athlete, his brother owns, owned, the, uh, I think, the first African-American discotheque in L.A., Mavericks Flat. And Alonzo told me one day, he said, you've got to come, you've got to move to uh, California, man. He said, this is a heaven. Well, compared to Gary. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I had some writing skills, and Alonzo, I was a pretty good poet, still am, a pretty good poet. But Alonzo uh, produced his acts, and we put together a musical, two musicals, in fact. He took it across the country, small time, but uh, I was uh, called by, like I say, the higher power, and I had to, I had to stay with San Francisco and the, the problems that the African-American boys were experiencing mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, so I just started basketball programs. That's the one thing I, I definitely knew. And of course, uh, how critical education was. And that's what we uh, stressed. And also the discipline of uh, what the church can bring to a person's life. And uh, again, that's my, I say it's my legacy is the amount of uh, young guys that went on and did great things uh, with their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Thornton, thinking about Fillmore when you were here 13 and growing up, what would you say were some of the strengths and characteristics of the community? I think the fact that we could see other black people mm -hmm. that it wasn't, um, when I left Galileo and I went to Balboa, there were maybe 50 black students in the whole school. Mm -hmm. And it was a school at that time that we were not welcomed. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a matter of, uh, when I met with a counselor, I said, I wanted to be a teacher. She said, the world of teaching isn't open for you. Why don't you be a singer? Mm -hmm. you know, or why don't you work for Pacific Gas and Electric or something or other? But mm -hmm. definitely uh, told me that I was not college material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how did you get involved in creating change? What was your pathway to becoming, to saying, you know, the, print, the counselor's telling you no, right? And you're like, mm -mm, you don't get to tell me what well, to do. How, how does that happen? Well, I didn't know what to do, but mm -hmm. at that time, they used to have a program called Senior Goals, mm -hmm. and they would have people, representatives, come from different businesses. And there was a person from the military. And I said, um, at that time, I was engaged, but didn't want to get married. Um, and I said, well, I think I'm going to go in the Army. And my brothers said, Mama, no, don't let her go. And my mother said, if that's what she wants to do, do that. And that was the best thing I could have done. Mm -hmm. Because I began to realize that 
I did have the skills. I wasn't as smart as many, but I wasn't as dumb as most. So <laughs> I was able to manage to uh, learn that your mouth can get you in trouble. So you had to learn ways to talk. Um, I went on to the military. I was enlisted. After three years of service, the, um, I was in physical therapy. And the therapist told me, surely either get out of the army and get some letters behind your name or curb your mouth. <laughs> but the two things were not working for me. In the minute. So I got out. I decided I wanted to be a physical therapist. I went to San Francisco State, majored in biological sciences, tried to go back into the military. I stayed in the reserves. When I went back to go on to the school of physical therapy, they told me at 21, at 23, that I had glaucoma. And so I couldn't pass the physical. Mm. So I had a BA in biological sciences, no minor, not knowing what I was going to do. So I, at that time, it was under the Fisher Bill. So I took a year, took 30 credits of PE, and ended up with a minor, took the exam, and ended up becoming a teacher in San Francisco. Wow, 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 wow. And then how did you go from teacher to principal to? Well, I remained in the, I remained in the reserves. And the one thing you do learn from the military is that if you have the skills and if you can prove your, your value, they can't stop you from getting the promotions. Mm -hmm. So once I learned to curb my mouth. Um, <laughs> like a theme, right? <laughs> and learn how to say things that was not necessarily get me in trouble. I um, became a, a phys ed and science teacher. And then I decided to go ahead and get my degrees. I didn't know what I was going to do with them, but I stayed in school. I got a master's in counseling. At that time, during the 60s, I was at Aptis Middle School. And I was one of the first, I was the first black teacher at Aptis. And um, every time there was a fight or a disagreement, they would call me from my class to come in and, and, and work with whatever was going on. And I said, well, I, I think I'll become a counselor. And at that time, Mr. Bersati, may he rest in peace, said that I would never be a counselor and I was lucky to even be a teacher. Mm -hmm. yeah. So after that, I became, you know, there was always someone who was there to guide you to the next level. Mm -hmm. So I was able to, through the assistant principal to get one period of counseling, then two periods of counseling. I had my degree, so I was able then to become a counselor. Mm -hmm. Went on to get my, my credentials, didn't know if I was going to be an administrator, but got my credentials. And so when it was time for to be an administrator, I took the exam. I scored high. And luckily for me, there was a woman on the panel that when they wanted to change the scores, because I had scored high, mm -hmm. they wanted to change the scores. She said, no, you will not change the scores. So I was able to maintain that position. But there was always somebody somewhere looking out for me. Wow, wow. So when you think about the challenges that you all have faced and some of the greatest successes that you've had, right, over the course of your life, what would you highlight as some of the greatest successes? I know, Reverend G, you talk about the, the boys, right, the young men that you were able to work with and how they've gone on to school. Is there, any, is there anything else you would add? What was your book? That you I know. That was one of those long questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I think I was writing instead of speaking. Um, <laughs> what would you say are some of one of the biggest um, successes, right, in addition to the young men going to college? and the, the mural. What else have been some of your successes in creating change for black folks? Well, it's been, what well, basically counts, I know basically everybody in that book, mm -hmm. and quite a few of them have, we've had conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, God has, has blessed me to know life. And uh, to say that I've had associations with many of those uh, great figures that you have in there who did grow up in the field more mm -hmm. and are from here. For me, that's uh, just a real honor to be able to say that. Mm -hmm. I forgot the brother asked me already. I said, "Young man," I said, "Well, I used to be young, but I'm a lot, a lot older than you think I am." <laughs> <laughs> but I'm 78 years old now. But came into the ministry at, at uh, 34, and um, and the bottom line, even the children. I mean, being a, I guess the word would be hip brother. Growing up in Indiana, like you know, we, mm -hmm. we, uh, yeah, 
we know different things <laughs> and been through a lot of different things and challenges, racism and et cetera, but being able to know life. And I feel like I've helped uh, just a lot of people who've come to me, like I say, even people in that book there, uh, older, but God has given me that gift to know life, experience life, and be able to provide wise counsel. I, I like to think it's wise counsel, mm -hmm. uh, even to, like I say, some of those folks in that book there. And uh, like I said, I, mo I know most of them, but um, I'd have to count that as my, uh, 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 Willie Brown again says that my collage is, uh, and I guess you have to see it to, to appreciate it. But I started out with that, just putting the picture of Muhammad Ali, who was one of my real heroes on the wall. And I saw the young brothers, Ali, Ali, put a few more things up. And I noticed them, noticed the guys go to the wall. And, uh, and I got the brainstorm one day. I said, you know, they may not read their black history books, but they'll read this wall. I had absolutely no idea that I would be able to, uh, yeah, well, the gym is big as this room here. Yeah, and all, all up, not, not the ceiling, but all up, upstairs there and everywhere. It's filled now. I had no idea I could do that. But not only there, but uh, other places. I have a room uh, that I dedicated to Willie Brown. He loves it. Uh, <laughs> but pictures all over. It's basically Willie Brown. Uh, who I, I, I tell people, one of the great black Americans, uh, well, Americans, period, uh, of our time is Willie Brown. And uh, in fact, it was very helpful to me at, uh, at a time when I need some help with housing here in San Francisco. Lived in one spot and thought the guy was going to sell me the building, I mean, the, the house. And he didn't do it. I went to Willie Brown and uh, he worked it out. Got uh, some specialists to deal with the guy. Got the down, enough money to get a down payment on, on my present home. And so he was uh, automatically a hero for me. But then I uh, began to learn more about the man and saw everybody honored and respected him. And, and, and in fact, we did some things at my ministry where we honored uh, the greatness of Willie Brown. Uh, and he and I became, I guess, uh, I think Willie Brown is 10 years older than me. He was like a big brother to me. And uh, everywhere I go, I lift up, you know, Willie Brown. But uh, <laughs> that collage, uh, you, I guess you have to see it for yourself too. But most people, they come in and they go, <gasps> And so enough people doing that lets you know you got something going on is, yeah. the, is the bottom line. Yeah. Uh, but you name the person, I basically have them on the wall, African-American, but also I have other people too, not just African-Americans, but predominantly African-Americans. Again, called the great cloud of witnesses from uh, a chapter in the book of, I uh, forgot what it was, is it Hebrews 12? Sure, we say looking at me for her. So, so <laughs> Hebrews see, 12. We got yeah. Hebrews out in the. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, <laughs> but, and it is a great cloud of witnesses. And, and I'm happy to say uh, I knew quite a few here in San Francisco. Been here for what, 40? What's this? It came in 78 up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, for some reason, uh, people take to me, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, and I thank God for that. I, I guess a friendly person who loves people, no matter what. Uh, some of my background, I tell people about my mother, that she had the great, other than Jesus of Nazareth, uh, my mother had the greatest influence on in my life. I used to watch her growing up in this, in the, I call the slums of uh, where we live in Gary, Indiana. But pe all people, especially colored folks, not just African American, but the Indians, Mexican folks, Chinese folks, we were all down there struggling. But she was loved by everybody. And I watched her and I just marveled at how she was there for everybody and they loved her. When there, was a, when there was someone died, death in the community, she was at the person's home, nobody had to call her. She cooking and washing and whatever she had to do. And so I saw my heart growing to be like her heart. And in fact, I used to pray, I don't want to be no chump that people, I saw them take advantage of my, of my mom. In fact, one guy came and uh, when my father died when I was nine years old, but uh, Mom took the money and bought a home and what have you. Most of my partners grew up in apartment buildings and everything, but we moved out to a nice house and uh, didn't have any money, but still we're in a nice house. I know what I know about the Salvation Army, which I'm thankful, uh, goodwill and all that. Not too proud, you know what I mean? That it's important to be able to relate to anybody. And uh, my my uh, childhood, again, watching my mother, and associate with people. They, I mean, you you didn't know that you were poor. <laughs> I mean, I had a great 
just had a great childhood. And uh, to this very day, like I say, uh, I relate with everybody. I don't care who you are. We're all just human beings. Nobody any better than anybody, uh, other person or what have you. And uh, again, when when the hound of heaven started hounding me, and uh, one day a guy asked me, have you, have you ever thought about seminary school? And I, I said, me? You know, <laughs> me? And bottom line, when I got home and thought about it that night, it just, I saw that I was being prepared my whole life to do what I'm doing today. And uh, I really enjoy helping people and all of this crazy stuff that's going on in the world today. You know, uh, it's all about honoring everybody. We, we're just one race, the, the human family and uh, helping people, helping each other, encouraging each other. Yeah, that's the name. Of the, for me, that's the name of the game, although it's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. And uh, uh, I'm just glad that I'm on the side of trying to help humanity become humane. Like they got a thing I'm working on now and I'm gonna write, uh, yeah. Great, and uh, Dr. Thornton, Reverend G talked about some of his influences, right? Who were some, or what influenced you? Who, you know, when things were rough, when doors were closing, you mentioned how there were people, always people there, but who, who were some of the primary influences in your life that, helped you keep going in those moments? Well, I think like Reverend Gordon, my mother, she said there's no such word as can't, mm -hmm. and that you, you believe in yourself that you can achieve, that you had to work hard. Uh, my mom was a, um, worked in a bakery, and she wanted to go to bakery school to learn how to do the work in New Orleans, and they wouldn't let her go. So she used to watch the guys decorate the cakes, and then she'd go home in the evening and teach herself. Mm -hmm. When she came out here, she worked at Woolworths at Mark, which used to be at uh, Fifth and Market, and she would work during the day. And then after after the eight hours, she would then work as a cake decorator. And it turned out the union said that that was not right. Uh, she was paid money for all the time that she had put in, and that's how we got the down payment for a home in Ingleside. Um, when I look at in school, I sang, and and in, at Balboa. Um, we were not in the academic classes, but because I sang, uh, everyone just said, well, I was going to be the, 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 the next Lena Horne or the next Miriam Anderson or whatever. So I was able to get over because I could sing. Mm -hmm. And, and um, when I look around, I was not, I didn't think I was smart, like I said, because I was told I wasn't smart. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went, when I went to City College, I thought, oh my God, I used to sit in a class and I'd say, oh, I'm so dumb, oh, I'm so stupid, instead of learning how to go up to the instructor, ask for help, ask for assistance, meet with a group and start working in a group, I would just try to memorize the whole book. Mm -hmm. So in biological sciences, I, my, my, my brain was in my hand, mm -hmm. that right and right and right, and when there'd be an exam, luckily there'd be a question close to what I had read so I could just... Do, do that type of work, but I never thought I was smart. Wow. Yeah, one major blessing I just thought about uh, from my uh, upbringing in Gary was that um, uh, racism was a blessing in that they built a black high school, and that's the school I attended, Gary Roosevelt High School. I guess uh, athletically, Dick Barnett is one of our great heroes from uh, the NBA. Um, but the bottom line was all these brilliant black teachers were all assembled there in one place mm. and they poured their life into us mm. you're going to learn that's the bottom line mm -hmm. the different things that you need to learn they would pull your coat you you're going to learn and i look at all my my, my uh, not all but the majority of the folks that uh grew up with me around that time when i was in school i mean everybody they say the teachers and then the colleges start hiring. I mean, it opened up when things got whatever a little bit open. But we had these brilliant black teachers, and I give them credit. I mean, and they took seriously. It's like Shirley. She everybody talks about her. She is a great one, absolutely great. You know that uh, uh, promoting the race. You got to do well. You got to be twice as better than whatever. Whatever. You got to. You got to study. You will learn. And we learned. And everybody went on. You're going to college. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And the I same thing growing up in New Orleans, I went to an all black school mm -hmm. and y y you were told that you were smart. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You know, so I believed it until I got out here until I was not smart. But it was amazing how um, going to a school where all the teachers are black, all the kids are black, uh, the teachers could, you know, hit you with the ruler if necessary, could do whatever you are going to learn, <laughs> period. Quite, learn. No, no doubt about it, you will learn. Mm -hmm. And then when you get out here, uh, I didn't get that. I got just the opposite. Right, right. And I also went to an all-black Catholic school in Indiana with, with rulers. <laughs> <laughs> They were effective. Um, <laughs> That's true. I'm just, they work. I don't advocate them today, but they. Yeah, my mother used to say, don't have me come up to that school. Yes. If you embarrass me, I will embarrass you. Yes. All the tough, <laughs> tough love. And, and everybody gave it. They loved us. You know, I look back and I mean, what a blessing to come from that, from the uh, my little town, Gary, Indiana. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a blessing. The people just promote the whole community. You know, the older people wanted the young people. You're going to learn. They, they invested in us for the future. And uh, yeah, I, 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 a lot of stuff is missing now that we had, that we got growing yeah. up. I knew I was going to go to Dillard. I wasn't going to go to Xavier because that, that was a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. But I knew I'd be at Dillard in New Orleans. So yeah. even when this high, they'd ask the question. And I was reared Presbyterian, and so we would uh, have to tell the folks every Sunday, where are you going to school? What are you going to do with your life? You know, and, and even if you didn't believe it, you say, well, I'm going to Dillard, or I'm going to Xavier, or I'm going to somewhere. But you had to have an answer. Right. And my mom, she would tell us, again, the nine of us, everybody's still here today. Mm -hmm. My oldest brother's 86. My youngest brother just turned 70. <laughs> We're blessed. But the bottom line, she would tell us every tub must sit on its own bottom. Meaning you are responsible for your life, your own decisions. You don't follow the crowd. Everybody's leader. I mean, in my family, mm -hmm. everybody's got a mind. They think, you know, just follow who we No, You're going to think it through. And we all, we respect each other's minds, but we had, we're thinking people. And that was, that was really critical. And she would always tell us that where there's a will, there's a way. She was absolutely right. You know, you don't stop. You know, you complete whatever you, you put your mind to it with the higher powers help. I mean, faith and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do anything. And she was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. It just takes, uh, I tell young guys that when they playing basketball, hey man, you gotta, you gotta work hard, you know? And uh, if you don't put the work in, if you put the work in, you're gonna get the results. That's about, and everything. And uh, in fact, athletics was, was a great teacher for me uh, and a disciplinarian uh, process for me, athletics. Uh, I can remember uh, our old coach, he would, for basketball, you had to run cross country. If you ever run cross country, time you start running, you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> and, but to learn persistence, uh, you got to keep going. And it's life. You don't let nothing stop you. I think about it, one of my professors in, uh, in, in seminary, you, you're so sure of yourself. You're doggone right. It comes from what those old folks put into me and what, you know, being exposed to that there's a higher power and the kind of thinking of you can't fail. You got it. You got to go. You can't let anybody stop you. You got to go. And uh, that's the way I played the game is of basketball and train other guys. It's the same way. You got to keep going and you got to you got to have you got to think that you're good. You can't you can't just be any ordinary. I got to think. Even Bill Russell, who, who, somebody was talking about Bill Russell, <laughs> although he's a great blocker. I got to think I can be Bill Russell when I'm coming in that, uh, in that circle. I know he's somewhere, but I, I, I got to outthink him some kind of way to get, to get the ball up high enough or something to beat him. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of training that we got to, that, hey, you know, you're going to be great. And so, you know, but that's, you know, when you, I guess when you carry yourself with confidence, some people don't understand that you're not not as you cocky and all this stuff, but no, that's the way you know we were trained mentally that you don't let anything stop you. Even like what Shirley was saying about people telling you, you can't do that. No, no such word as you can't. Mm -hmm. I can do all the things, but then my mother put through Christ who strengthens me, <laughs> and so yes. you know, and that's the mentality I have to this very day. And I pass it on to our young folks. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do something. There's no such word as can't. If you make up your mind and you're willing to work, you can do whatever. That's the bottom line. Don't let anybody tell you what you determine for yourself what you want to do. And if you make up your once you make up your mind and you're willing to work, nobody's going to give you anything. You got to work. Right. And God gives you the breath of life. 
what you do with it is your gift back to him. But you, he gave you the gift of life. And, you know, hey. Right. Yeah. yeah well, I have to say that at USF, I received two letters. The first letter when I went, applied for the graduate school said I was not accepted. And that I was not, when I met with the committee, um, they said that I acted like I knew everything, that I'd already <laughs> written my dissertation, so what was I going to learn there? And I said, well, I've been a principal now for about 10 years, so I do believe what, I do, what I'm doing is right. I'd like to validate what I'm doing is right. Um, so I was not accepted. Luckily, through Brenda Harris, you mentioned her earlier, Brenda had already talked with the president of the college, and, and we used to have meetings. And um, luckily, I was, was told, well, no, let's uh, give her another chance. Um, and I received the, the letter of, of acceptance, and then I ended up getting the highest award in, in the School of Education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the person who denied me had to give it to me. Ah. <laughs> right on, right on. <laughs> so, um, a couple so of things. I'm, okay. I'll okay. say that, to say never give up. Never give yes. up. Never give up, because I, I really, um, for a number of, of things, I didn't think I'd make it, but it was like when I became an officer, I was 13 years in the enlisted military. I had a counsel, I was a counselor at Aftis. I had a father who had kids at the school who was also in my reserve unit. And every time I'd call him, I'd tell him how bad his kids were. And finally one day he said, I thought you were going back on active duty. I said, well, I was told I couldn't pass the, the exam, um, the eye exam. He said, next drill, I want you to report to my office. So I reported to his office. He took me down to ophthalmology and he said, I want you to check her eyes and I want you to say she does or she doesn't have glaucoma. I didn't have glaucoma. Mm -hmm. So I would have been the first African American in the School of Physical Therapy in the US. US okay. But that was okay because then I ended up being a teacher, which is where I was probably supposed to be anyway. So I was able to maintain my military and retire full colonel and also do the uh, education. Right. Wow. So you all have already started touching on our last question. And the last question is, I know I have, can I see the hands of all my lovely uh, students from the Marshall Riley Living Learning Community? So this is the... Thank you. Um, so in this room, we have next generation of black leaders. Hmm. And if you could give them a piece of advice so that 30, 40, 50 years from now, they're sitting on this stage as change makers. I know you started touching on some things, you know, Reverend G, you even talked about that athletics and the way that was giving you discipline and focus. And then Dr. Thornton, you talked about the military and even your family and the ways that that sort of helped you and guided you. But thinking about these future generations, what? You're no better than anybody. You're no less than anybody. You're just another human being that God has blessed you with life, the breath of life. What a privilege, what an honor to. I lost a great grandchild, stillborn. Didn't get a chance to do anything, but you got a chance to develop and be whatever you decide you want to do with your life. But if put your whole self into it, be the best at everything you do, no matter what it is. Don't shuck and jive with it. <laughs> I'm serious, you know, take it seriously. You're going to be the best. And hey, you, you, you do your best. There is a God. I know you're not, you, your generation in many places, they won't, won't let you explain, won't let you say that it is, uh, is one. I'm letting you know right now that is a higher power that is for all of us. The Bible says to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. This, this thing is all about being able to respect and honor everybody. You're no less, no better, but God has made you equal to anybody. All things been equal. And you can do anything you make up your mind to do, but you got to work. People like to just shuck and jive through life. Be the best at whatever you decide or make up your mind to do. Don't shuck and jive. And when you get to be older, dude like me, you'll be happy that you did, that you're able to deal with all sorts of whatever it is, you know, because you gave and, and you can, when it's time to retire, which my wife isn't trying to get me to do, I say, well, that, to retire and do what? <laughs> Die? <laughs> I want to help these children. 
you know, and I'm happy right now that you asked that question. And I'm just really great to see you young folks out there to let you know you can do whatever you make up your mind to do. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise, but you got to work. Yeah, thank you. I ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to ask questions. I think what we have to do is learn how we have to depend on each other and work and in, in study in groups rather than by yourself, which is what many of us will do. Um, I think we spend a lot of time denying our own intelligence because we've been told by the world that we're not smart. So we're having to always prove ourselves. Um, and I think we just have to believe in ourselves. I think we have to make sure that you tell the person next to you, man, that was really great. You really did a good job because we don't hear that often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So any final words before we move to- I'm just curious, how old? How old are y'all? 18, 18, okay. Young adults, actually. Mm -hmm. young. Mostly first, we got some, <laughs> we, yeah, we, we, uh, we have a range, but first, second year and transfer students at USF. We got other young people here too. Um, but you don't let nothing stop you. Even the mothers tell us, where there, again, where there's a will, there's a way. You know, even about the economics. I've gone through college and, and gone through graduate school and what have you, and uh, got out. I don't know about anything. You know, people, it's whatever, it's out there. It's out there. It, 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 the blessings are there. And I say it's, it's the higher power. You know, keep your heart. Be about love. Don't be about a bunch of crazy stuff. You know, one wrong mistake can blow your whole life. You know, stay on. If somebody won't go act crazy. You you keep yourself focused. Because one mistake can blow it. And I've had friends that grew up with me that, you know, hey, it didn't turn out too well. But it's your life. And you've got to make decisions and take responsibility for your life. This is your life. Okay, what everybody else say, it's your life. You've got to make wise decisions. And uh, if you get in a situation where you might get messed up some kind, don't go there. You know, I'm a very, uh, what do you say, uh, cautious person about everything, you know. And because uh, uh, I've been taught this way, one mistake can blow it all for you. So you want to, you want to, and this is your life. You don't want to mess up. You want to come on, get on out on, you know, wind up at advising other people, you know, or whatever. Uh, by example, not just talking stuff, but it's real. But it's your life and you're responsible. Take charge. And I hope you remember, I'll say this for me. Every tub must sit on its own bottom. Say that for me, please. Every tongue. Every You're time. responsible for yourself. That's the bottom line. Every tub, and that's one of the most wisest things. I tell the kids, I've been every passing tub. on for a long time. That every, you respond, meaning you're responsible for your own life. No excuses. Don't come up with no, 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 this is your life. You mean you fell for that or you fell for, no, no, no. You, you know, it's, don't blame anybody. It's you. Take charge of your life and don't, don't, don't shuck and jive. You, 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 you are going somewhere. Uh, 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 see, as you said, uh, these are your young leaders. Mm -hmm. You're going somewhere. You mm -hmm. don't know exactly where, but you, but she has the faith in you and know, and she's got the exposure you and know, but you, uh, you, you, clearly we can see in your eyes that <laughs> you're going somewhere. Don't let anything, don't blow it and don't let nothing stop you. And, uh, my mom, we should always say with, uh, trust in the Lord. She would say the Lord will provide, not just, you don't know where it's going to come from. She would say the Lord will make a way somehow. She was absolutely right. I think also that it's important as students to get to know your professors. I know I remember um, because I wasn't sure of myself, I'd sit in the back of the classroom. I'd be afraid to ask a question because I didn't want to sound stupid. You know, but then I, what I realized as a professor, the students who would come up to me and ask questions and want co uh, college time to sit in conference, when it was time to give that grade, if it was an A minus or an A, and I would have spent time with that student, it'd be no way they wouldn't get the A because I had helped them. <laughs> so that made me feel good that they were coming to me for assistance. So really take time when you don't understand something, stay after class. Don't be the first ones out of the classroom when it's break time. Hang around and see what, what students who are getting the A's, would, would, what they did, and all, you follow that same behavior. But get to know your professors. 
uh, get the, but get them to know you, uh, let them know what your future is, get to know folks in, in, in the audience, get to know what, uh, as older people, what we're doing. Um, I have a friend here who is a Superior Court judge from Los Angeles. How did that happen? Why did you go to Georgetown? What was that about? Did you plan to do that when you were teenagers? Because our lives change as we grow up and we talk to different people and you go, wow, maybe I am interested in law. Or maybe I am interested in being a teacher. We need black teachers. We need teachers of color. You know, we keep talking about this pipeline, but if we're not out there, our kids have no one to turn to. They're not, you know, we don't have world language where our kids are bilingual, but many of the kids who are in our schools now are, but African-American students, we're not. So we're already behind the eight ball with learning to be, be out in the great world. So we need a second language. We need to look at what does it take to be successful in America and where am I on that path for success? While you're being confident, stay humble. You know, just stay humble. Be able to relate to everybody. We're just human beings. If you can help somebody, help them, because you're going to need help too. <laughs> and uh, it goes around, it comes around, but be helping to help the human race to upgrade itself. Do they have questions for us? That's where we're going. Um, so we're going to open it up for Q&A. Um, and if you have any questions. Um, OK. So the, the first question is from uh, someone on Zoom, Scarlett Gordon, and they asked, how do we continue to rise in being change makers going forward in light of the diminishing African American population in San Francisco, including the numbers of our youth growing? We can't hear you well. Maybe I'll move your mask, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, this question is from Scarlett Gordon. And they asked, how do we continue to rise in being change makers going forward in light of the diminishing African American population in San Francisco, including the numbers of our youth growing to be change makers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it says that we just have to work harder and we have to be out there and we have to be willing to stand up when something isn't going right and there's a lot that's not going right that we have to stand up and, 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 and say it and, and look at how you're going to correct it. We know we have to get folks out to vote. If you're not involved with wearing a, a sign or a, a, a pin, or if you're not involved with looking at being a, a poll worker or out there using the phones to call folks, we are at a terrible past, you know, time right now in America. And if we don't go out and take the leadership role, we're going to find out that we're behind the eighth ball. So I think you really have to actually get out and get involved in some sort of organization that's looking at what's wrong in America and how do we fix it. And I think a lot of it is education. We have got to get our kids to understand the importance of education. That's something that whatever I was getting ready to say slipped my mind that quick. <laughs> but uh <laughs> She, I think I think she did. Maybe she did it. She took it. <laughs> <laughs> um, other questions? But make sure you you uh, the number one person that you are responsible for is yourself. Make sure you got your act together. Uh, you know you then then you're not one that falls through the crack. Then you can help somebody else too. But, but be involved as uh, 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 Madam Thornton is saying today. Be involved. But make certain you don't fall. You're not the one that falls down and falls through the crack, you know. Have your act together and know you got your act together. Then that means we had, we, don't, we don't have a problem with you. We got to help with somebody else and some other folks. You know, we can't we can't take responsibility for people. Uh, if they got to leave San Francisco. Let's let's be real about this thing. It's extremely expensive. Yeah, here in San Francisco, you got to have some money to to get. I mean. I, some of these houses they're selling for a million dollars. I say, you got to be crazy. Uh, you know, I live in Richmond, I bought a home in Richmond. But the bottom line is, I'm, uh, uh, maybe that's kind of selfish, but I mean, but make sure you're not the problem, but that you can help. You got to always reach back, but get your act together. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Oge. Um, I'm also one of the students in the MRLLC. But my question was, as such, 
successful individuals yourselves, how have you guys established balance between working so diligently towards your goals, but also valuing yourself? I can't understand what you say, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll repeat myself. Um, being such successful individuals yourselves, um, how have you guys established a sense of balance between balancing, I mean, valuing yourself as an individual and your mental health, as well as working so diligently towards your goals? I still didn't follow the oh, question. It's, uh, sure you got it? Yeah. Yeah. I think in retrospect, I put probably 23 hours a day to work and less to myself. That's it. I mean, it, you know, if you're a high school principal, the, they want you at the football games, but they also want you at the wrestling match, and they want you at the ping pong, and they want you at the this, and so you, you, you know, you want to dance, and you have to do, you know, you're always, you're always on the go. And then you're dealing with your community and you're involved with organizations in the community. I mean, it's a 24 hour a day job. And Dr. Thornton, just to follow up, do you think that's a sustainable way forward for, especially as I think this question is thinking moving forward, right? That has been what well, has I think, had to be done. Is that what we should continue? I don't know. Well, I know for me, it took the, there was no such thing as balance. I was married to my job. Right. I don't know why I'm missing, I'm missing this question. The question is, um, doing everything that you do, uh -huh. are you taking any time to take care of yourself? They say I don't. <laughs> <laughs> do you think this is a generational thing, maybe? Maybe maybe it's a generational thing, that coming up in the time you did that, that idea of self-care maybe wasn't as prevalent as what it is today, right? That's a theme today. Okay. Yeah. I was, uh, I, well, again, I'm 78 years old. Mm -hmm. I can still shoot a little bit. I was a shooter. I can still shoot a little mm -hmm. bit. But uh, I sailed through life until I got, uh, when I reached 70 years of age, I had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was some serious stuff going on, although I believe, I said, you know, my work is not done here, you know, talking to the big man. You know, I got work to do, especially the children, of, uh, they need help. We never don't believe education is critical. It's critical. You've got to be an educated person. You've got to be able to read. You've got to be able to uh, teach other people, uh, young folks or whatever, you know? So life is serious. And uh, again, I, I pretty much sailed through till I uh, even played basketball until I was 70 and was showing my great grandson how to, how to, uh, what was it, rebound is what I was doing. And jumped up like I was still a young buck and, and came down and, and uh, did something to my knee or whatever, and the thing just swore up and swelled up and blood clots. And the guy said, you better be glad the blood clots stopped like lungs area. If it went to your head, you've been dead and gone. Mm -hmm. But I can't, you know, I can't be as active as I was then, but I sailed through life mm -hmm. looking out for me and making certain if you can't, if you're not here, you can't do nothing with nobody else. You got to get yourself together. I mean, one, one while somebody said, you, well, I guess it was, it was a, the spirit telling me, you can't help others until you help yourself. You got to be in position to do things, you know, really help folks and put the time in that I have put in in my journey with other people. And even to this very day, uh, I'm, for, you know, I'm for people. That's the bottom line. And uh, thank you for saying I'm successful, <laughs> whatever that means, you know what I mean? It's been great. You know, but I'm still a humble person. But I, and whatever I can do to, to help somebody, especially young people, you know, and like Shirley said, you you know, you put you do what you got to do, and uh, but be you're not the only one here. Know that you old, you know, you old, you old people. That's the bottom line. People helped me. I didn't just get to people poured you know poured themselves into me. I'm a combination of a lot of people. I tell people you got to learn how to listen, and I've always listened from a young youth on up. You know. And what I found out is that these young, these older folks was not as stupid as I thought they were. If you take the time to listen, they go, when they, and they take the time for you, they're going to uh, uh, help you along the way and make you uh, not fall into certain areas and certain dishes that you would fall in otherwise. If you, if they, I'd say it's like a like a cash register when they give you knowledge or give you something, take the time with you, and listen. And it's like uh, somebody put a hundred dollars in your bank and it goes choo choo. When you get the knowledge from somebody else, a lesson that they learned or whatever, you know, so take the time to listen. Young people think they know, not, I don't mean, I'm not talking about y'all now. 
They know everything. You can't possibly know everything. People have been here long enough. Everybody had to grow up. Everybody had to be you at some point in time. And and uh, so you don't just, because you get older, you don't lose, although you can lose, but you gain and you got your whole life. So take the time to listen, young folks, really. It's critical as far as advancing you in life and helping you make uh, uh, what you would make it, would have made an error, spending, wasting time on something else. Somebody who's been through can already can warn you or tell you if you listen, but many won't, don't want to listen. I've certainly seen it in the younger generations now, but that's a critical thing to do, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Carl. Hi, uh, my name is Carl Levy III, and I just have one question. I was wondering over the years uh, that you've been here in this amazing life that you all have, what is the best advice that you would give us as young uh, young black students to collectively bring our community closer together and to build, you know, better solitude with each other, but also the people that aren't necessarily in the community that we have right now? Be humble, and 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 feeling yourself that knowing that you've got to work together. It takes a team to win, you know, and all the jealousy and all that, whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, be humble with everybody, you know, and and lift each other up instead of tearing each other down. Kids out there fighting about shooting and all this mad, all this madness when it's all about love. Faith, hope, love, these three, the greatest of anything is love. The Bible said teaches, and I've learned it's the truth. The book also says they who love are born of God and know God. They who do not love do not know God because God is a spirit of love for everybody. If you got a brain, you got to say amen to that. I don't care who you are. And that's what's wrong with the world today. You know, because I'm a black man, you don't, you, you have, when, when we talk about love, we ain't talking about no intimate and all that stuff. We're talking about honoring and respecting and helping and whatever, you know, helping another person instead of tearing them down. Uh, you got to have that kind of camaraderie with yourselves and with your, you know, your peers and whatever. But it takes a team to win. And I don't care who scores the basket. Let's win this game. I think you have to um, be set an example. I mean, we don't have the you know SNCC and all these programs of the past. But what organizations do we have as African Americans? And how are you supporting each other? How are you working with your brothers and your younger brothers and sisters and helping them? Um, I, I I'm 83. Um, I watch television and I sound like my mother now because I I watch uh, you know. What, what are some of these programs about uh, the Housewives of Atlanta and yeah. all these different programs? And yeah. if I was a teenager today, what message am I getting? That I don't like you, that I have to curse you out, that I have to talk about you, that we have to fuss. So what's the message for a 13 year old? I mean, how do you dress? What, I mean, so our kids today have less of a example to follow unless you're out there giving them the example, helping them understand that you can be cute, but you can also be smart. Okay. And I don't think we believe that those two things go together. So I think as, as young people, you have to set the example for your younger brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews to help them understand, to sit with them, to read with them. There are so many books out today that, that can help them. But how, how often do you see your younger brothers or sisters or nieces and nephews reading? Do you buy them books? Do you give them reinforcement? Do you ask them about what's going on in school? How's it, what's, you know, what's going on in their life so that they feel that they're important? Because a lot of our kids today don't believe they are. Yes. Hi, my name is Zaina, and my question my question is essentially about how, what is your view on the evolution of the Black community? Do we think Do you think we're more connected now, less connected? Do you think we're less connected with our roots and more connected with each other? Where do you think we stand as a community now, in comparison to what you experienced um, growing up? I believe we're less connected. Because I believe we, we thought that when we did the 1954 and we did Brown versus Ed, Board of Education and that we were going to integrate, which we never did, we desegregated, but we never integrated, that we, we believed somehow that the laws would change and that all of a sudden we'd be welcomed into America and it hasn't happened. And I don't think we have figured out how, what do we do with this now? We know that as, as we look at America today, they're, they're not going to accept us as, as full 
uh, members of the society. So what do we do? When I grew up in New Orleans, we had our own pharmacies, we had our own doctors, we had our own teachers, we had, we had our world around us that reinforced you could be someone. When you come out here, there's nothing. So I think you guys have to form organizations to fill that void that's there. But I don't think we are um, better today than we were before. As you can look at uh, your peers, your peers, how, how can the young people be killing each other? Where did this come from? I mean, as far as I know, we didn't, I mean, growing up, we had just had fun. If we fought, we, we would, somebody, everybody went home and then went to bed. Wasn't no killing people and stuff. This is just a whole nother, and I think part of it is uh, when they took God out of schools and no prayer and all that, you know what I mean? The higher power is real. This is no game, you know what I mean? And young people, we had to, my mother and my father, we had to go to, uh, to Sunday school on, on Sundays. No, no laying around in, in, in the bed and all that. We studied the, the, the word and stuff. And, and again, it proved, even when, when I got a little older, I said, I'm not going to anybody's church. But when times got rough, I found myself back to my roots. And many of your peers don't have that kind of roots. Where, where everybody's, we were together, we, everybody was for, for the young people. And um, not everybody, but you know what I mean? The majority of the community would do things to help the young people. Nowadays, there's no respect for, for the older generations in many, many cases. And like, like the older people don't know anything. And uh, they're afraid of young people. Many of them are. But shooting and killing and no love, we had a lot of love for, we loved everybody. I, I, I loved school. Everybody, we just had fun. Didn't have any money, but we had fun. <laughs> the bottom line, we had fun. We have and, another uh, question over here. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you so much. Just listening, uh, Miss Scarlett Garden, Lefty's wife, started the question off, and it seems to be repeating itself in different ways. Where is Scarlett? Uh, she was the very first question online, online, yes, but you know, when I'm listening to Dr. Thornton and yourself, Reverend Garden and um, Ms. Stephanie hearing you for the first time, I am so moved and I think of my childhood coming up around you and um, Reverend, you were just right around my age then. Mm. But I think of Dolores Baugh, I think of Burl Toller, I think of Bessie Brooms, I think of Willie Brown, and so many others, Lefty Gordon. And my thoughts are many of them are gone, and the last few are still here, you and others, Willie Brown. And so when I see the youth that are here today and the young adults, I think, this needs to carry on the stigma from the housewives and the husbands and tearing each other down and doing a show to keep the series going mm -hmm. creates a stigma that's not true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a it's a lot going on in that that may have truth to it. But there's another truth that we are intelligent, we are strong, we do not pull at each other and we move towards success. So I would love to hear this on their campuses. I would love to hear this conversation and the story about change makers. Our churches used to be the hub for this. And we met together and then we met at one another's homes. And during that time, the young adults were always invited and a part of it. And we had to serve the appetizers while you spoke and taught. And so with the few that are here, dating back to our beginnings where we continued the story over and over again, this needs not to be the only place where this is heard. It needs not to be the only uh, environment where a conversation so rich is going on. And if there's anything you can do to keep this traveling so that the society around us will hear more about the change makers and the history of it, the roots, and what we can do to connect the dots, connect the generations, and excite our young adults about 
their successful lives, their destiny, and our social security that needs to keep going. That conversation does not come up that if they don't train those behind them, there will be no social security. There will be no stabilization. So I'd love for this to go forward. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Molly Kirkwood. Um, I just wanted to like agree and piggyback off what you were saying. Uh, I think sometimes like on both ends, it's often easy to focus on the negative of each generation, our older generations and our younger generations. And I think sometimes we forget to have the conversations that need to be had and enter the world of the youth nowadays because although yes there is a lot of negatives that happens it happens but there's a lot of positives and living amongst these people who i been so blessed to do that and hearing their stories and learning their intelligence i just think the positive always outweighs the negative um, in the younger generation and i think that we just need to have a more open mind when it comes down to hearing our stories and hearing you all's stories because I think you know our ancestors and the ones who came before us hearing their stories is so important. So I just wanted to piggyback off that and just say how important that is. But all children can learn. That's one thing I had to, I learned. Yes. You all just geniuses, fresh from heaven. I mean, just <laughs> wide open anything. But you got to discipline not just you, but all you got to discipline yourself, and uh, you got to want it. Or you got to do it. Yeah. Nobody's going to just give you anything in life, basically speaking. You got to go after it and you got to be prepared. What they talk about opportunity, reading, meeting, preparation. Right. You got to have yourself together. Right. Now, I, now I'm from Gary and you, you're, from, you're from Indiana, I'm Indiana from too. Yeah. Now, that's somebody we're talking about, uh, some folks from Chicago. In Chicago, young folks are going crazy, and Gary now too. They're killing like just, I mean, just shooting people. How are you going to just shoot people? I mean, I don't understand the image. Yes, ma'am. Well, I was going to, yeah. Justin. So, yeah, my name is Justin, and I just had a quick question. So coming from the Midwest and in the South, what were things that, like, when you came out to San Francisco, sparked that, like, initiative to become a change maker? Like, what was the thing that when you got here, that was just like, boom, I need to make a change? For me, it was just, again, my heart. I love people and I especially love children. And I know the potential. I know how people still young kids, especially of other races, that you can't learn. That's a doggone lie. You can do every, anything, the whole world, young geniuses just need a lot of love and encouragement. And also they gotta know themselves that there's somebody. Once you, but once you really know who you are, I say that the sky is the limit. Once you, as a black person, you really know who you are. I mean, it all began in Africa. Let nobody, let, in my mind, there's no doubt about it. Even the gen geneticists, I mean, talk about what the deal is, you know? And, and I believe that wholeheartedly, that, uh, you know, you are somebody. Mm -hmm. Don't nobody tell you you're nothing. That's, that's a doggone lie. And, and, and all these lines that go like, how can, what's going on in, in politically today? You know, how are you gonna buy a lie? If somebody's lying, they're lying. And, and you see intelligent people following a lie. All of a sudden, they're liars. How are you going to live a lie? You know, what's the truth? You want to know the truth about everything, and especially who you are. You're somebody. And once you know who you are, you know, nobody can pull you down, I don't think. Dr. T? Yeah, I think it is important to get into a role where you can help others. I mean, when I listen to the students now talk about how I used to chase them in my high heels and then I used to stand in front of cars and tell them not to leave campus, I can't believe I did that, but I probably did. <laughs> We'd have a, a, a game at the, in, the, in the bleachers and didn't allow smoking, didn't allow, any, you know, when, when I listen to the students talk about how I behaved as it related to their behavior, I must have been crazy as a principal. But what I find is that the students thank me you know, they say you were hard on us, but you helped us understand. And I would like to have some of the, for you, as you get older and as you get involved, I want young people to come to you and say, thank you for guiding my life. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for believing in me. Because a lot of our kids need that sort of reinforcement. So for me, I learned that um, it's important to acknowledge 
the talents of our young people because it's not often that they get the reinforcement of that. Did you have a question? We have another, one more. One more question. Yeah. A question and, uh, and to some extent, uh, uh, perhaps a response to uh, what Reverend Gordon has said and what the young people are asking. Uh, I think it's important to look at history. There's something called the Opium Wars that occurred in the early part of the 19th century where Britain put drugs, opium into China. There's something called the crack cocaine wars that occurred in this community and that destroyed, in all communities in this country, that destroyed the black community as we knew it to be becoming in the late 70s and the 80s, really wiped it out. And Rev, if you think about the implications of the crack cocaine wars, you'll understand why Young people in Chicago, where I grew up, in Mississippi, where I grew up, around the country are killing each other because they were born exposed to this drug. Mm. It destroys the part of the brain that allows you to experience joy. Mm. This is what we're experiencing. You can look into their eyes mm. and know what they have experienced as young people. So young people who are back here are a part of that history hopefully without it touching them in the way that it touched one in four babies born in Philadelphia, 1,000 born a month in Chicago. I sat in the largest dependency court in the world where we had 10 cases a day for approximately 10 years in 20 courtrooms. Hmm. Do the numbers of babies born exposed to crack cocaine. So there's a reason for these things happening. We can't condemn those young people mm -hmm. who are experiencing a terribly painful part of life and who have experienced a terrible painful part of, who have experienced a terribly painful part of life and who are killing one another. And nobody in the academy, which I have been a part of for 40 years, is doing the research to look into that history and to recognize its impact on the black community, it destroyed it. I took a sabbatical just briefly, mid eighties, came out to Santa Barbara, was teaching at the University of the District of Columbia in the Department of Criminal Justice and Business Administration. I came back and my best students were on crack cocaine after one year. This is the reality, guys. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, yes, 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 crack, yeah, yeah, I, I actually. Remember, I'm a, I remember one guy asking me, have you ever done this? Is that, uh, are you crazy? <laughs> I mean, you know, that was my response. Well, how are you gonna tell somebody something if you haven't experienced this? You gotta know what, 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 what is like the crack cocaine. That's a different thing than smoking grass. It's two different, it's two, what's how you say, two horses of a different color. You got to have the knowledge to know what's going on. I mean, nobody, what, you don't have to have the knowledge? It's complicated. I just think it's really complicated. It is? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, is it complicated? It's complicated. I mean, but it's like, really I know that crack cocaine will mess your mind up. I know. There's nowhere in the world. If I know this, I'm going to do it. But that, 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 that does, that's not true. It's, it's not just not as simple. Okay. I mean, I understand what you're saying, and I think that it's really complicated. Oh, okay. um, and all of a sudden, I have to cough. Sorry. <coughs> oh, sorry. It's like Officer Crump. Could, I don't know. Why oh. can't they be like we were perfect in every <coughs> way? Sorry. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm fine. I just got a little. <laughs> I think that that crack cocaine conversation got me. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to figure out how to respond. I got everything on. Um, we're going to start wrapping up, but I asked the question, "Where's the restroom?" So don't wrap up too quick. I'm going to get back. Okay, we're going. Huh? It's, you, gonna, it's okay. okay. You, you excuse me. Yeah. We'll wrap up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do your thing. Do your thing, Reverend. Uh, go. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm about being honest now. I'm not going to be honest about that. No. Do your thing. That's important. 
personal needs. <laughs> um, so we're going to wrap up today. Um, and first, I really just want to thank our distinguished panelists for being here, for sharing your stories, your insights, your wisdom, and for starting that conversation, that intergenerational conversation that's so needed in our community. It feels like, for whatever reason, there's been a break where these stories don't get shared across, and this wisdom doesn't get shared across the generations. So I really thank you and Reverend G for being here and being a part of, of turning that tide. Um, I also, as we wrap up, just want everyone to think about that definition of change maker, that it is a social innovator, a social disruptor that imagines a new reality that creates new possibilities and takes action with others to solve social problems for the greater good. They reinvent rules, they do things differently, and they're prepared to travel upstream against the current. Change makers move beyond intention and passion, and they translate thoughts into actions. We have been honored to, to hear from two people that have done that in their lives. But I also want to say that there's no reason that all of us in this room can't also be change makers. Each one of us has the capacity to think outside our current realities where we're finding injustice, where we're finding oppression, and to imagine a reality where that, that does not exist. We have the capacity to work with others to fight for what's right in this society. And so if there's anything to take from today, to take from the stories, to take from the wisdom, to take from this expertise that's been shared with us, is that we don't have to do great. We don't have to be king. You know what I'm saying? We can be teachers. We can be preachers. We can be people who work with others, who are humble, who can show others their greatness, and in those small acts, those small everyday acts, we can reconnect Black communities and we can create a change. So with that, um, we are moving into the reception. So I want to make sure we give a big round of applause to our distinguished guests. And before, before we head out to our reception in the cafe space, if we could have everybody in the audience who's willing come up and take a group picture, that would be greatly appreciated. Yep. And once again, let's give a big round of applause to Reverend Gordon, Dr. Thornton, and Dr. Stephanie Sears. Thank you both. I know, right? Not too good. Wait, hang on. Are these off? Come on. I don't know why this keeps... Good to see you. <laughs> I know, hang on, let me.